is Hungary showing the way for American politics or, I mean, to what extent is, is Hungary a cautionary tale uh, versus maybe something else? I, I, I have written extensively, it's in, in fact, I, I document it in some detail in my book, uh, The Hidden History of American Oligarchy, about how Hungary has descended into oligarchy. Victor Orban took over. His, his message is, uh, you know, pretty kind of straightforward, uh, modern day Republican. Minorities are bad. Uh, people who are not Christian are bad. People with dark skin are bad. People who are not uh, cis, who are not, you know, gender identity, who aren't completely straight are bad. Um, uh, I mean, he just, he just lays it out and, and uh, you know, just, you know, he's the, the family values guy, right? This, this, is, this has been his shtick. And, and once he took power, he basically turned over most of the media in the, in the, in the country to buddies, the privatized media, to, to oligarchic buddies or people who became oligarchs as a result of it. And he took the state-controlled media, their equivalent of NPR and PBS, and turned it into basically Fox News in, in Hungary. And now he's facing an election. It's on April 3rd in Hungary. And, and by the way, he's, he's won the, the love and approval of American conservatives and the Republican Party right across the board for doing this, for turning Hungary into a Christian right-wing ethno state where suppress, so, uh, dissent is suppressed, where the media is essentially locked down, where uh, most of big business, most, most business is controlled by a handful of oligarchic families. The Republicans love this stuff. So, so much so that CPAC is holding a, uh, an annual meeting there in, in Budapest. And in, in I just, I think it's just a month or so down the road. But in this election coming up, it's getting really fascinating because there are six parties. You've got uh, Orban with his Fidesz party, which is basically the, you know, just a little short of, uh, it's not the Nazis quite. It's kind of like, you know, the soft Nazis. Um, but then there's these six other parties that range from a, a fully progressive party, a, a kind of Bernie Sanders progressive party, to a fully old-fashioned conservative party, um, you know, to the extent that they're, they're, uh, they're taking positions that are, I don't know, socially conservative, shall we say. You know, they're, they're not supporting, for example, uh, uh, gay marriage or gay equality or things like that. They're not supporting... Um, you know, more immigration into the country. So you've got this spectrum. But the, the guy who is most likely to give Orban a run for his money on April 3rd, and again, the observers in the country are still very skeptical that anybody can take on Viktor Orban. I mean, the media is, uh, he owns the media. His party is spending three times more on social media advertising than anybody else is. So he kind of owns Facebook and other social media. Uh, so the odds are very, very high that on April 3rd, Viktor Orban is going to get, quote, reelected. But the, the one guy who's taking him on with this six-party coalition, including, you know, from the left to the right, is, is a, uh, a fellow by the name of uh, Peter Markeze, M-A-R-K-I-Z-A-Y, Peter Markeze, who is a conservative. This would be like having Adam Kinzinger run against Donald Trump. I mean, it's, it's that sort of thing. He's, he is a, uh, you know, a business loving, you know, traditional family values. And I put that in scare quotes, um, conservative. But everybody seems to be rallying around behind him because he's not Orban. Because he's not, you know, buddies. I mean, Orban uh, two weeks ago spent five hours with Vladimir Putin. Um, he's, uh, Jair Bolsonaro is coming to, you know, the, the, the strongman dictator of Brazil is coming to Hungary this week so that they can hang out together. Um, but this guy, you know, they, they point out that every, every time, you know, Orban has been very successful in trashing liberals in his country and, and using really the, the, the same kind of hyper inflammatory language like Republicans do here. Uh, you know, when, when speaking about gender issues, using words like grooming, and when speaking about race, uh, you know, using, using terms that, that deny the humanity of other people. I mean, this is, this is Orban's stock and trade. And the conservative who's leading the challenge to him is only halfway there, but, you know, is still kind of 
on the edge of that camp. But he is getting attention in as much as he's not Viktor Orban. So, you know, keep, keep your eye on this. This is going to be real interesting to watch. Um, uh, this was, for example, Orban gave a speech right after he spoke with Putin, speaking about himself and Putin. And he said, and I quote, we think differently from each other about Europe's precious legacy of tradition. Uh, we think differently about the future of nations and nation states. We think differently, I'm, excuse me, he's, he's speaking about himself versus the rest of Europe. We think differently about the future of nations and nation states. We think differently about globalization, and now we think differently about the family. And uh, this is this is his whole uh, Orban's. You know, he, he, by the the we when I said you know him and Putin, that was the we. Orban and Putin think differently than Europe about Europe's precious legacy of tradition, and nations and nation states and globalization. So it's going to be interesting to see how this plays out and to what extent he can hang on to this thing. Over on BuzzFlash, uh, my old buddy Mark Carlin has a fascinating piece. It's titled, Ukraine is Putin's Sudetenland. And I, I absolutely agree with this. Mark is putting this in historic context about how uh, the Sudetenland, part of Czechoslovakia, um, was basically, you know, given up. There was a large German-speaking population there. And and, uh, you know, they, they, uh, the world essentially, you know, gave it to Germany. And Neville Chamberlain said, okay, that's it. That's all he wants. And then, you know, it was on to Poland in 1939 and, and the massacre of Poland. I'm, 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 I'm with Mark on this. I don't think that this thing ends with, with uh, Ukraine if Putin wins. On the other hand, if he loses, this could be the beginning of a substantial new world order. And frankly, I think the wild card in this whole thing is going to be China um, and, and the United States, of course. So, you know, we'll see. We'll see where this goes. Anyhow, uh, let's pick up.